Well, it's with a joyful heart that we open God's Word again to receive promises and power. God is a God of new starts and fresh beginnings and second chances. God is the God of glory days. And if you could use some fresh starts or second chances if you're interested in some glory days, welcome to the study of Joshua. The book of Joshua occupies itself with the story of the man and the people God led out of the wilderness into the promised land. And if you're interested in some promised land living, then his story is for you. The Glory Days Declaration is going to appear on the screen. I want to invite you to fill your lungs with air and your hearts with hope as we make the declaration together. You ready? Say it like you mean it. These days are glory days. My past is past. My future is bright. God's promises are true. And his word is sure. With God as my helper, I will be all he wants me to be, do all he wants me to do, and receive all he wants me to receive. These days are glory days. Yes, Lord, we open ourselves up now to new possibilities. We beg you to soften our hearts. They grow cold and calcified with years and hurts. Forgive the sins of the one who speaks. There are so many. And let us see Christ, just Christ. Through Christ, we pray. And all the church said, Nod and Corey was 13 years old, 5 foot 2 inches tall, and weighed 100 pounds soaking wet. His attackers were in their late teens, twice his size, and outnumbered him seven to one. For 30 minutes, they hit, they kicked, they beat him, they dragged him through the snow, they stuffed him into a tree, they suspended him on a seven-foot fence. He never stood a chance. Corey and his mom had recently moved to the Philadelphia suburb of Upper Darby. Her job as a maid at a Minnesota hotel had vaporized and she was in need of work and so they moved to Philadelphia. In 2000, the year 2000, she had immigrated from war-torn Liberia. So Nadine Corey was the new kid in a rough neighborhood whose mom was an immigrant. Everything that a wolf pack of bullies needed to justify their attack. They began by picking on him. They called his mother names. They routinely shoved and pushed and ambushed him. And then came that all-out assault on a January day. Now, Nadine Corey survived that attack, but he would have certainly faced more had it not been for the folly of one of the bullies who recorded the pile-on on his cell phone, then posted it, on YouTube. Neighbors saw the violence and got angry. Police saw it and got involved. The bullies landed in jail, and the story ended up in the paper where it was read by a producer of a nationwide morning show called The View. She read it and invited the 10-year-old boy to appear on the show. He did. As the video of the assault played on the screen behind him, he tried to look brave, but the camera picked up his quivering lip. He told the hostess, next time it could be somebody smaller than me. Unbeknownst to him, the producer had also invited three other people from Philadelphia. And when the video ended, the curtain opened and out stepped three huge men, members of the Philadelphia Eagles football team. Being the rabid fan that he is, Nadine Corey immediately smiled, a smile of recognition, especially when he saw the face of all pro wide receiver Deshaun Jackson. Jackson took a seat on the couch next to Corey and promised him, any time you need us, I got two linemen right here. 
Corey's eyes widened saucer-like as Jackson signed a football jersey and handed it to him. Then, in full view of every bully in America, he gave the boy his cell number. And from that day, Corey was only a call from his personal bodyguards. Thugs think twice about picking on a kid who has an NFL football player's number on speed dial. <laughs> Pretty good offer. Wouldn't you love that kind of protection? Corey isn't the only person to feel like the new kid in a neighborhood full of thugs. Trials and troubles come at us all with flying fists. Wouldn't you love to have a few wide-shouldered bodyguards to walk you through life? I want to tell you, you've got so much more. You've got so much more. You have exactly what God promised Joshua. You have God himself. I want to talk to you about the presence of God. If you like to fill in blanks, there's your cue. God told Joshua, no man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. Just to recap, the book of Joshua is a bridge book that describes how God led the children of Israel out of the wilderness. They were already out of Egypt, but they got stuck in the wilderness because they heeded their fears more than they heeded their faith. They could have crossed over into Canaan 40 years earlier, but they were afraid, and so they spent 40 years wandering in the badlands of fear. Finally, God chose to lead the children of Israel, some two million of them, across the Jordan River to retake the land that he had given to Abraham, the promised land. And the book of Joshua documents this seven-year campaign in which Joshua and his soldiers reclaimed the promised land. Joshua needed some assurance. He knew, though God was with him, he knew what awaited them in Canaan, bullies, Amalekites, Amorites, evil, bloodthirsty, barbaric people. He also knew that his soldiers were, for all practical purposes, untested. His leadership was unproven. And yet, in spite of the odds, God said to him, no man shall be able to stand against you all the days of your life. Why? God says, because I am with you. Inexperience doesn't matter. Their experience doesn't matter. What matters is I am with you. He didn't tell Joshua to grit his teeth. He didn't send Joshua to advanced military training school. He didn't tell Joshua to get new weapons or to recruit a new army. He never admonished Joshua to have a positive mental attitude or read a book on leadership. He simply said, I'm with you. And that's all you need. It was as if God told him, yeah, Jericho has its tall, thick walls, but you got me. <laughs> Amalekites, yeah, they're, they have the home field advantage, but you have the advantage of the king on your side. The enemies have more chariots, they have more artillery, yeah, but you have me, and that's enough. God tilted the scales in favor of Joshua simply with his presence. Today, would you allow God to say the same to you? God gives you the same promise, the very same promise. In fact, the New Testament epistle of Hebrews uses the very same words to speak to Christians. For God himself has said, I will never leave you or forsake you. So we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Now left apart to itself, that last question is a tough one. What can man do to you? Well, you know the answer to that, right? Man can lie to you. People can disown you, abandon you. 
What can people do to you? Well, apart from God, they can do much. But that's not the question of Scripture. The question of Scripture is, if the Lord is your helper, what can people do to you? Since God is strong, you can be strong. Since God is able, you can be able. Since God has no limits, you have no limits. With the apostle, you can boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? But there's more. God not only stays with you, he fights for you. He not only gives you his presence. Look at this. The power of God. Remember, the story of Joshua occupies a seven-year block on the timeline of ancient Israel. I want you, please, in your imagination to go forward this seven years. Go forward these 20 battles. Go forward into a time in which Joshua and his people have reclaimed this territory. And Joshua delivers his final address at the end of the book. He was 80 years old when he began the invasion. Now he's nearly 90. So much for the excuse of old age. He has a rush of white hair. He has a belly-length beard. He has a stoop to his back, but boy, his voice is strong. And when he lifts his hands to speak, all the voices of the soldiers fall silent. That sea of men looks up at him. He led them through the wilderness, through the Jordan River, into Canaan. When Joshua speaks, they listen. I am old, he says. Advanced in age, old indeed, this guy saw everything since the days of Moses. Then he says, you have seen all that your, the Lord your God has done. Again, the mid, men nod in agreement. All oh, the stories they could tell. The Jordan River opening, Jericho Wall falling. The sun stood still. All of the enemies scattered. And now they're beginning to indwell a land for which they did not labor, harvest from fields they did not plant, drink from vineyards that they did not build. But Joshua, in his final message to them, wants to make sure they get this point. He said, the Lord your God is he who has what? Has fought for you. You took this land not because of your skill, but God's. Throughout the book of Joshua, it is God who does the fighting. In his call to battle, Joshua told the men, go into possess the land which the Lord your God is giving you to possess. Then again, the Lord your God is giving you rest, giving you the land. And then on the eve of the Jordan crossing, Joshua said, the Lord will do wonders among you. As they stood on the western side of the river, Joshua deduced, the Lord your God dried up the waters of the Jordan. And then on the outskirts of Jericho, Joshua said to the people, shout, for the Lord has given you the city. The entire book of Joshua reads like this. God fighting, God moving, God giving, God claiming, God defending. And then in this culmination, in this final speech, Joshua gives this declaration. For the Lord has driven out from before you great and strong nations. But as for you, no one has been able to stand against you to this day. One man of you shall chase a thousand, for the Lord your God is he who fights for you as he has promised you. Boy, don't you love that phrase? One man of you shall chase a thousand. I'm seeing one solitary Hebrew soldier with his sword drawn chasing a thousand Amalekites or Canaanites up the hill. They're turning and they're running. A thousand of them are turning and running because this one Hebrew comes in the name of God. I'm seeing the same for you. I'm seeing the fears that come at you a thousand at a time turning and leaving because you come at them in the name of Jesus Christ, the King of Kings. And you come at them with sword unsheathed, the Scripture of God, and you stand on promises. And all these fears that come at you a thousand at a time, a legion of anxieties and troubles are 
questions or doubts. They come at you, but then you stand up and you defy them in the name of Christ. And they turn and they leave. They turn and they run. Let everybody else cower in fear. You don't because you belong to God. You're a child of God. You're an ambassador of God. You're a representative of the king. They turn and leave because you come at them in the name of God. Folks, this is glory day living. This is glory day living. You were not made to live in fear. You were not made to hide under a rock. You were not made to be defined by your past. You were made to be a living, breathing expression of God on earth. That's your destiny. That's your destiny. And it begins when you come out of the wilderness and you receive God's promise to you. What is God's promise to you? The very same promise that he gave Joshua. He promises you his power and his presence. He's going to always be with you. He's going to always be near you. God fights for you. God fights for you. The system may be against you. The economy may be against you. The company may be against you. The corporate culture may be against you. Even your health may seem to be against you. But God, the CEO, the top dog, the czar, the rajah, the head coach, the ruler, the king of kings, the limitless God fights for you, deploys angels for you, controls weather for you, sends messengers for you, sends protection ahead of you, sends protection behind you, provides cover for you. He is for you. Glory Days 101 says God is for me. He's not against me. He is for me. God is for you. God is for your family. God is for your health. God is for your prosperity. God is for your contentment. God is for your family. God is for your restoration. God is for your spiritual development. God is for your kids. God is for your marriage. God is for your faith. God is for you. As long as you live beneath the cloudy lie that says God is against me, you might as well post a mailbox in the wilderness because you're never coming out. It begins, this exit out of the wilderness, this exit out of the dry lands begins when you accept by faith the promise that says God is for me. God fights for you. Yes, you. You. You with the receding hairline. You with the grumpy boss. You with the aging body. You with the diminishing bank account. You. You. You with the bad back. Bad credit. Bad job. You. Are you a you? Are you a you? Then you qualify because God fights for you. The big news of the Bible is not your fight for God, but God's fight for you. The big news of the Bible is not your fight for God, but God's fight for you. And since God fights for you, you know what this means? You fight with heaven's resources. Whatever heaven has, you have. All the heavenly blessings are at your disposal. How much patience is in heaven? Well, you have access to it. How much self-control is in heaven? Well, it's all yours if you need it. How much forgiveness is in heaven? 
I think there's enough to forgive yourself. I think there's enough to forgive others. You don't fight just with your intellect. You don't fight just with your wisdom. And you're not defined by your past or your heritage or your ancestry. You're a child of God. So you live, you fight through life with heaven's resources. When Amy Carter was 10 years of age, her father was elected president of the United States in 1976. Since her dad was president, she had access to resources that you and I don't. One particular instance, she was studying on the Industrial Revolution, studying about it. She asked her mom for help. Her mom couldn't answer the question. So her mom called a White House aide who called the labor department. <laughs> that was on a Friday. Sunday afternoon, a truck arrived at the White House from the labor department and began to unload reams of paper on which information had been written and collected. The labor department had assigned a team to work 24 hours a day around the weekend to answer this question. They thought it came from President Carter. <laughs> when the first lady saw the research, she was embarrassed and horrified at the cost, but it was too late to correct the mistake, so Amy used it. Still, she made a C on the paper. <laughs> Most of us live with a dash of envy for people like Amy Carter to have a pop as president, to have a grandmother as a queen, to call a king your father or the prince your brother. Oh, life would be so much better if only I had blue blood or a silver spoon I was born with. Hey, I want to question that. May I be so bold as to say they have nothing on you. You're a child of God. You're a child of God. This means that you carry within your spiritual self the very DNA of God. You are activating the fact that you were created in the image of God. Now you're living it out. You're his ambassador. This means when you speak, you speak in the authority of God. And when you go to work or when you go to school or go into the hospital, you are representing the king of kings. Take that. You're a member of God's priesthood. So you position yourself between the world and God. That's what a priest does. You intercede. But the scripture says you even have a seat with Christ in the heavenlies, you don't have a seat in parliament. You don't have a seat on the Supreme Court. You don't have a seat in Congress. You may not even be able to get a seat at the Spurs game, but you have a seat in the heavenlies. That is to say, you're actively involved in the government of the universe. Your prayers figure in and are calculated into how history unfolds. You have resources of heaven at your fingertips. You fight with heaven's resources. Even more, this means you're worth fighting for. There's something about you that is worth fighting for. Life can just leave us feeling small, marginalized, on the edge, forgotten, like a number in the system. But then somebody comes along and stands up for us, represents us. Three NFL players stand up for us. <laughs> We're no longer the forgotten kid at the school. We're the one that was remembered and defended. Changes the way you look at yourself. Many years ago, I preached my very first sermon I finished college and received an invitation to deliver a Sunday evening message in my hometown, in my home church. Now, some of you don't 
you're not old enough to remember Sunday evening services in small town churches, but that's when the B-level preacher would speak. <laughs> but hey, it was my first sermon. And so I accepted the invitation. Now, no sermon is perfect. But a preacher's first sermon, boy, I make no effort to defend mine. I gave it a good effort, but I'm very confident that I meandered and wandered in an effort to say everything. I probably said very little. I don't pretend that the sermon was noteworthy. But still, I, I didn't deserve the criticism that I received from the pastor. He invited me into his study for a post-service post-mortem. <laughs> he had already summoned a group of men to witness the confrontation. And he pounced on that sermon like a hawk on a rat. He told me I told too, few, too many stories, that I used too few scriptures, that I was too clever, too cute, and too easy on sinners. By the end of the harangue, I felt like a scolded puppy. So I tucked my tail between my legs and walked out into the church parking lot where my dad was waiting for me in the car and he could tell something was wrong and when I told him about the meeting his face began to redden his grip on the steering wheel began to clench his lips became a single pursed line he dropped me off at the house and said simply I'll be back soon Well, it wasn't until the next day that I heard the rest of the story. A neighbor of our pastor saw it all happen. My dad pulled into his driveway. The pastor was out in his front lawn with a garden hose watering something. And when he saw my dad, he put the garden hose down and walked over and extended my hand, his hand to my father, but my father did not take it. And he did not return the niceties. He immediately demanded an explanation. He started giving him the what for and the how much. The preacher hemmed and hawed and eventually apologized to my dad. And that next day, he called me and apologized. I'm not defending that sermon. But I got to tell you, when my father defended me, wow, that was a wonderful thing. What's that? You, you wish someone would defend you? You'd love for someone to stand up on your behalf? To rally against those who rail against you? You'd love to have a story of somebody defending you? Don't you understand that every page of the Bible is God's declaration of God as your guardian? Of Him protecting you? of him seeking you, of him pursuing you when he became flesh, when he became like you, he was rescuing you. When he fought against the devil in the wilderness, he was fighting against your enemy on your behalf. When he loved the marginalized, the neglected, the sick, the abandoned, was he not declaring that even right now he loves the marginalized, the neglected, the sick, and the abandoned? And friend, dear child of God, when he died on the cross and took your sin on himself, was he not fighting for your salvation? When he died your death and rose from the dead, was he not fighting for your eternal life? And when he joined you together with him in that mysterious union that we call the substitution, and when he died, you died, and when he rose, you rose, and he placed you in that seat next to him, spiritually speaking, in the heavenlies, did he not do everything that anyone could ever ask a heavenly father could ever do? You have a white knight who has come and rescued you. You are a princess who has been pursued. You were sold into slavery, but he came in and he fought your enemies and he rescued you like the SEAL Team 6 and he pulled you out. 
you must be worth fighting for. You see, God is for you. He fights for you. Would you receive that today? Would you just kind of let it sink down and soak up? Two people wake up to the same sunrise. One person wakes up and says, oh, no, another day, another day of misery, another day of pain. Everybody's against me. The system's against me. The government's against me. The odds are against me. God is against me. Right next door, another person wakes up and says, you know, it's, it's going to be a tough day. But, you know, I believe God's for me. I believe he's on my side. I believe he's gone ahead of me. I believe he's already into the midday and into the evening. I believe he's already disentangling some of the problems. And once he opens the door, no one can close it. And once he speaks, no one can silence him. He is already ahead of me. He is leading the way. I'm going to have my problems, but you know what? I have the ultimate problem solver. I have a few mountains, but I have the mountain mover. So two people wake up to the same sunrise, but with two different attitudes. Of those two, which will receive the blessing from God? Which one? Which one will receive the blessing? Let me tell you something. Some people eliminate themselves from God's blessing because they heed the voice of the adversary. Are you blessable? Are you? Are you just disqualifying yourself before you even climb out of bed? Glory Days 101 says, I don't know why, but God's for me. I don't know why, but I'm going to believe him. And I'm going to press forward into this day believing that in the right way, at the right time, God's going to work it out. I realize this is tough for some of you because you inherited a bunch of junk or you've done a bunch of junk, but once and for all, you've got to, boy, you've got to make a, just a break with that. You've got to say, these are glory days. My past is past. My future is bright. I mean, you just got to, you got to begin chasing those thousand enemies up the hill. And it's time for you to come out of the wilderness. Here's what the psalmist said. He said, God won't let you stumble. Your guardian, God, won't fall asleep. Not on your life. Israel's guardian will never doze or sleep. Look at this. God's your guardian. Right at your side to protect you, shielding you from sunstroke, sheltering you from moonstroke. God guards you from every evil. He guards your very life. He guards you when you leave and you return. He guards you now. He guards you always. The world will always have thugs in it. But you have the upper hand. Because guess who you have on speed dial? Amen? Amen. Let's be standing now. Lord, we bless your name. We praise you for who you are. We give you credit and we give you honor. And now, dear Lord, as we come into your presence, we pray that the right word for today will sink into our hearts and that you would help us to be different people, not just hear a message and walk away from it, but to be changed by your truth. Through Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen.